Well, hello and welcome to Insight with Political Tools and Beyond the Headlines. Have you got a few billion dollars that need stashing away? Would you like a shell company to house your funds? And would you like a new nationality or even possibly a diplomatic passport just to make sure your ill-gotten funds are properly protected? These, these tricks and others are all wrapped up in Moneyland, a country with no fixed abode, worth approximately $32 trillion by some estimates, and all the subject of a wonderful book by the author and investigative journalist, Oliver Billow. Hello and welcome, Oliver. Uh, hello, thanks very much for inviting me. It's great to have you here. This is a second discussion we've done on um, sort of criminal finance or illicit finance. Previously, we spoke to Tom Keating from Rusi last month. And with your help, we're going to take a tour of the wonderful, not so wonderful things that Moneyland can do. Um, it is worth reading the comment on the back of your book here, and that's by um, Simon Cooper um, in, the, in the New Statesman. He says, you cannot understand power, wealth and poverty without knowing about Moneyland. And the overall point is that financial crime has victims, huge numbers of them, and that's what this book brings to life, as well as the enormous complexity of the systems that are used to cover it up. Um, I want to start off with, though, Oliver, by going back some 70 or 80 years ago, um, at the end of the Second World War, when the Bretton Woods Agreement was being put into place, and essentially the concept that well, money was a lot more close, tightly regulated, and the idea that the governments that printed the money um, had had as much control over it as the as the people who had it in their pockets. And, and I'm, the reason I want to to start with that idea is I think it's a, an, a valuable comparison for what what situation exists today. And you used this um, idea of an old oil tanker full of money, of money sloshing around, this sort of unstable boat that you need to sort of keep control of. Can you just explain a bit about that to start with? Um, yeah, it's a really interesting question and quite a hard thing, I think, for people who are, you know, too young to remember it, to, to get their head around because the world is so different now. I mean, at the moment, you know, it, world governments are debating this idea of a, of a global minimum tax rate, 21%, and trying to stop corporations or wealthy individuals shifting their profits to places like Bermuda or the British Virgin Islands or Ireland or Luxembourg in order to try and make sure they pay at least a small amount of tax rather than essentially nothing. Um, you know, back in the in the immediate years after World War II, the 1950s and early 1960s, this would have been a no, totally nonsensical idea because it was really difficult to move money from one country to another. Essentially, the governments led by the US particularly and the UK um, were they tried to make sure that something like World War II could never happen again. They'd come to this idea that World War II had been caused by fascism, fascism had been caused by the Great Depression, and the Great Depression had been caused by the 1929 stock market crash. And this idea that sort of speculative money was racing from country to country around the world, pumping up these um, you know, stock market bubbles and then rushing off and leaving the, taking the profits and essentially leaving the countries to, to pick up the pieces you know, and causing, you know, widespread misery. And they wanted to get ahead of this process and prevent it happening again. So essentially, um, they would allow money to move from country to country to, for if a company wanted to invest, if Shell Oil wanted to invest in a new, in Nigeria, for example, or wherever, but they could only do that with permission of the government. The government had a, essentially a veto of money moving from country to country. Um, and in a way, it was nonsensical for dollars to be anywhere but the United States, for pounds to be anywhere but the UK or some of the UK's colonies, for francs to be anywhere but France, for example. That's just where they were. The idea that they could exist anywhere outside their home country was, was sort of nonsensical. And it's actually quite interesting, this idea. I mean, I'm a big reader of, of thrillers. I love trashy thrillers. And quite a number of, of um, you know, really quite famous thrillers, like Goldfinger, for example, the Bond novel, is totally incomprehensible if looked at from a modern perspective. You know, the whole sort of basis of the beginning of it, and Bond has to go on this sort mm. of you know, car chase to Switzerland. Um, the, the whole basis of it is that is that or at Goldfinger, the baddie is trying to smuggle gold out of Britain to Switzerland, and this is you know tremendous negative consequences for the British economy. If you look at it now, the idea of moving a car full of gold from Britain to Switzerland. The idea that could have any kind of negative consequences for British, the British economy is, is bonkers. Mm. And yet in those days, it was genuinely really important that the government knew how much bullion there was in each country because it was the, the, the foundation of its currency and currencies had to remain 
fixed to each other. This was the, the downside or the flip side of, of money not being able to move is that currencies didn't move in relation to each other. You know, a dollar and a pound were, you know, were fixed. A, you know, a Swiss franc was similarly fixed. And mm. the world was a much more predictable place, um, which was extraordinarily successful from an economic perspective. It led to you know, the, the, the greatest level of equality the world has ever seen. Um, you know, a, a constant decades worth of economic growth without any interruption. It was an amazingly successful system. But um, from the perspective of very wealthy people, it was extremely annoying because if they couldn't move their money from country to country, there was nothing to stop governments from taxing that money as much as they liked. And they really did. You know, we had you know, marginal tax rates. You know, we're talking about 21% now as if that's shocking. You know, marginal tax rates up around 95% weren't uncommon in the early 70s. Um, yeah, and that's a, it's a totally different world. And, and, and the whole birth of money land is essentially comes out of wealthy people attempting to avoid having to pay 95% tax. It was that process that led to the, the, the whole growth of this sort of stateless, irresponsible international money that caused all the problems. I, I really like the fact that you made that point at the very beginning, this idea of money being um, sort of frothy, uncontrollable, um, and it's like oil in this tanker that's sort of unstable. And you know, if it moves around too much, and there's too much uncertainty around it, it can it can bring the ship down. And and that connection between the the instability of the 30s uh, and finance and what had happened beforehand. So I think it's a really good good starting point. But the book itself, you really go into the the nitty gritty of how um, uh, financial crime works. And I think what we're going to do now is to take a journey through how that those funds are stored, where that happens, and the kind of impact that it has. Just to start with, I, I think um, you, you, you indicated there that um, people in London found a way through the system and began to find ways of, I think it was with, with bonds to start with, of selling things that couldn't be traced. So maybe talk just briefly about that, and then I want to go to the Caribbean. I mean, yeah, it's, London, you know, had been the financial capital of the world. There were a lot of bankers in London. But, you know, after the Second World War, because money couldn't move around anymore, they had nothing to do. I mean, you know, it's amazing reading about it now, how boring the place was. If you think of London as being this great financial centre, it really wasn't that. It was very sleepy, very out of fashion. You know, just nothing was happening. So you had bankers just sitting around twiddling their thumbs, really. Um, and meanwhile, you had a load of people trying to dodge taxes. And the easiest way for Europeans to dodge taxes was to stick their cash in the boot of their car, drive to Switzerland and stick it in a bank. And the bankers in Switzerland didn't ask any questions. They didn't care. So you, you put money in a bank in Switzerland. You didn't earn any interest from having money in a bank in Switzerland, but, but at least you didn't pay any tax. So, so money was piling up in Switzerland. It got to the point when about 15% you know, of all the money in Europe is in a bank in Switzerland, just sitting there, not doing anything. And meanwhile, you've got bankers in London twiddling their thumbs with nothing to do. And, and this bankers who worked for this bank, Warburg's, which was a bit of an outsider type bank, looked at this situation. Here's a load of money, isn't doing anything. Here's a load of bankers who aren't doing anything. Well, let's get them together and see if they can make something happen. And, and they did. Essentially, they, they, it's a very you know, clever piece of financial engineering, but essentially they created a piece of paper that was somehow nowhere. It, didn't, it, it, it wasn't in Britain. It wasn't in Switzerland. It, was, it wasn't in America, but it was denominated in dollars. It wasn't in the Netherlands, but it was issued at Schiphol Airport and so on. So you had this this piece of paper that was kind of create a new kind of money. And this new kind of money wasn't anywhere. It just was money. And it was tax free. It was totally anonymous. And they had this great new word to describe this kind of money offshore. It was, it was as if it existed out on the oceans outside of any one country's sovereignty. And as soon as you had this money, if you could buy, use your money in the bank in Switzerland, and if you bought it, not only was your money earning you a decent profit, but no longer was it stuck in a hole. You could enjoy it. You could take a piece of paper anywhere, exchange it for actual money, buy things, and it set stolen and tax evaded money free. Um, because this isn't just tax evaders money in Switzerland. There's also, also you know, what we'd now call kleptocrats, you know, politicians who'd stolen a fortune from their home country and stashed it in Switzerland. They could take advantage of this too. And what it meant was it became suddenly very profitable to steal. And um, as a result of this invention, if you, if you stole a load of money, you bought these, what they were called euro bonds, then, then you made a fortune out of the money you'd stolen. And, and if you see um, you know, the whole phenomenon of kleptocracy, of this egregious grand corruption that's you know, one of the world's most serious crises at the moment, it really takes off in the 1960s after Eurobonds are invented. Countries like Nigeria, uh, the Philippines, Angola, 
they, they all become afflicted by this terrible corruption around the same time. It was a, a simultaneous process. It does, it does, all you, over you, the world. Could steal, you could steal the money beforehand, but hiding it and spending it would be the problem. Yeah, I mean, you could always steal money. I mean, I'm sure there's always been corruption as long as there's been power. But, you know, if you stole a fortune in the past if, if, and then spent it, it was pretty obvious you were spending money you shouldn't have had. Um, so you, you had two choices. You could steal it and bury it in a hole in the ground, in which case you may as well not have bothered stealing it in the first place. Or you could steal it and spend it, and then the chances are you'd get caught or certainly found mm. out. Um, what offshore gave people is this amazing third option. You could steal it, stick it in a hole in the ground, and spend it all at the same time. You, you could essentially mm. spend anonymous money. And that's the amazing invention that they created. It, it, it was a new revenue stream for London. It got London back in business. Um, and it was an amazing opportunity for corrupt officials and that they could steal as much money as they wanted and get away with it so you know it's this you know essentially alliance of convenience between the city of london and the world's worst people um which you know london couldn't have done it without them and they couldn't have done it without london and that, yeah. that alliance remains true to this day you don't get kleptocrats without western enablers they're not all in london but london does tend to have the best ones so as you say, I mean, arguably London is the, the has the biggest concentration of these services, the biggest concentration of illicit money facilitators uh, in the world. But let's, I think, in in our minds, we think about um, places like the Cayman Islands, um, St Kitts and Nevis, um, places like that, which is so far away. You know, this really, this doesn't happen here. This might happen in Jersey, and it's certainly going to happen further away. Can you just talk about um, the, the the sort of traditional villains of this world? And one is called Billy Herbert. Yeah, I mean, it's really important to recognise that when we say Britain is enabling this, we don't just mean the United Kingdom. Britain is a is much bigger than that. You know, places like the Cayman Islands, Jersey, Guernsey, Gibraltar, the British Virgin Islands, all of these places are still British and they all um, have the great advantages that, that Britain has and also advantages of their own. Um, but but back in the, um, in the 1970s, uh, one of the places that was... British, uh, still is British, is a place called Anguilla. And Anguilla was next to uh, St. Kitts and Nevis, um, uh, an independent or soon or becoming independent Caribbean state. And they and they shared um, many ties. They were right next to each other. They had at one point been the same colony. And Billy Herbert was this extraordinary man. I mean, I'm, I'm discussing making a TV film about him because he's so incredible. Um, essentially, he combined this amazing life as on one side, a great St. Kitts and Nevis patriot fighting for St. Kitts and Nevis to be independent. He ended up becoming its ambassador to the United Nations when it became independent, um, while also being a lawyer in Anguilla, which was a British protectorate. Um, and so he essentially lived in two worlds, one of them independent, the other one British, and used the advantage of this sort of double loophole to move incredible volumes of money, launder huge volumes of money for, for the mob, um, for um, the IRA, as it turned out, for almost anyone who'd ask him, actually. He set up the shell companies, moved the money through his bank, and so on. And he was the real, you know, in a way, this embodiment of, of this idea of tax havens as, you know, a sunny place for shady people. You know, Billy Herbert was this very charismatic, very funny, very bright. He was a, you know, had a, had a, a he was a doctor in law, um, you know, UN ambassador, really entertaining guy, but also a colossal rogue um, who, who was very happy to allow anyone to move any money of any kind. And um, he came to eventually came to a bit of a sticky end. He died in a boating accident in the 1990s. But but that's another story. But, you know, he, he is sort of often when we think about, you know, the people who enable kleptocracy, money laundering, we think about people like him. But the really important thing to remember is that, you know, though he was important, um, he couldn't have functioned without Britain, without Anguilla, without the fact that there was a British colony and it was a badly regulated, badly controlled British colony. So it's it's essentially what you end up with is, is a you know, the British Empire transforming itself um, from, you know, a, a world power into just a few fragments of land around the world, each one building up its own separate offshore industry, all of them connected to the sort of, as it were, the mothership in London, um, and, and moving money freely for anyone at all. And essentially, this became the new revenue stream, it became how the fragments of the British Empire, you know, earned a living. I mean, you know, the Cayman Islands... There's this, this disconnect between... Um the people who are providing the service and the sort of criminality at the other end. You go to St. Kitts and Nevis, and I love the bit in the book where you walk into the archives of Nevis <laughs> and, and there's an archivist there and it's clearly chaos. Could you just talk a bit about that, but also what that reflects? Because you also actually went to the 
the officials who are in charge of this to and the press officer as well just to put put your questions to them yeah i mean so, i mean the reason i one of the reasons i'm so interested in st kitts and nevis apart from the fact it's just a gorgeous place is that billy one of great billy herbert's great innovations in fact his great innovation in the history of offshore is he invented selling passports um you know passports had previously been something you either earned through birth or something you earned through descent you know you could an ancestor would come from a country therefore you had a passport or you were born in a country you had a passport billy herbert saw no way why you know that things should be limited in that way he had clients who wanted passports new passports under a new name so why not sell them one um you know he, they ran the government they could do what they liked so they invented this new it's now called citizenship by investment which is just a you know a clever way of saying selling passports and i wanted to know about how this came about you know what where, where are the minutes of the government you know who 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 came up with this idea how was it explored so i went to the to kits archives and it's just chaos i mean it's like two rooms just which could barely be more full of paper in fact there were um some documents i was told i couldn't access and i asked did that mean they're confidential so no no you literally can't access them they they exist but they are in a room full of paper at the end of a corridor full of paper um and this is the problem so you have this combination of total chaos um mm. you know, colossal chaos i mean there was there were recordings of parliament on cassette decks on cassette tapes but no one could find a cassette deck to listen to them so um so it wasn't really possible to get hold of them uh, I mean, yeah, how, the, big is, how big is nevis what's the population of nevis well, the, the nevis is is the smaller half of the of the federation there's two halves the population of st kitts and nevis is about of st kitts is about forty thousand, and nevis is about 10 or eleven thousand. so i mean though nevis is not an independent country it has almost complete autonomy so so you've got st kitts creates this whole passport selling industry and at the same time nevis with a population about equivalent to a sort of normal kind of village um but surrounded entirely by water creates um you know a, a shell company business it goes off on its own and sells these shell companies that are incredibly murky i mean they're some of the, the hardest to find the ownership information for in the world i mean just trying to find out the office where they're registered is almost impossible um and i went i did as you mentioned i went in to talk to you know the the, the woman who heads their financial you know regulator and you know to say that these these shell companies are connected to financial crime is understating what's going on i mean almost any financial crime of you know Viktor Yanukovych the former president of Ukraine he owned his coal mines via Nevis um you know I mean multiple crimes you know this guy the the flash crash there's a sort of famous um crash on Wall Street which was led by a rather dodgy British um share trader he put his money in Nevis I mean it's just a dodgy place um and I you know said this to the to the regulator and, and she just wouldn't accept there'd been any scandals at all she laughed in my face at the idea that there had been you know it's not is it, you know, essentially, it, it, they, both St. Kitts and Nevis make money from selling services to foreigners mm. for which they get all the benefit in St. Kitts and Nevis, but all the harm happens elsewhere. And you from know. their point of view, they're a poor island, poor island, miles away from anywhere. You know, why not make it, make it, take advantage of this? They've got sovereignty. This is all we've got. You know, we're going to make some money out of it. And, and as, long as, as long as you can't see the damage, you know, get on with it. Well, yeah, I mean, quite reasonably, the Prime Minister of Nevis pointed out to me that the calculation Nevis is making is exactly the same as the calculation that London made in the 1950s and 60s, which is you're struggling to make a living. You know, how are you going to make a living in this new world? Um, mm. Well, look, but there are a load of foreigners who want help um, getting away with crime. So why not let them do it? You know, you're essentially if, if you don't do it, somebody else will is more or less the calculation. So so why not get away with it? You know, there is always someone dodgier than yourself that you can say, well, at least I'm not Panama, or at least I'm not, you know, the Marshall Islands or whatever. Um, and and it, there is a strong degree of hypocrisy in the criticism of St. Kitts and Nevis. I mean, I'm quite careful to make this clear in the book that um, if you criticise St. Kitts and Nevis without also criticising the city of London or Manhattan or whatever, then you're really missing the point. Because, you know, what what the, the what they're doing is merely following a trail that was blazed by bankers in yeah. London, particularly, and also in New York slightly later. Yeah. Um, you know, so the, the 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 idea that essentially you sell offshore services, services where the the, pro, the all the profits are accrue to you, but all the harm happens somewhere else. That's the the business model of 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 many many financial centres. And we're going so to get into that in in just a moment. But let's talk about um, to try and sort of clarify a, a bit more the victims um, and go to Ukraine. We've done lots of programs on Ukraine. Um, uh, you know, the corruption there is endemic. And there is also this sense that, well, you know, uh, it's Ukraine, it's always been like that. Um, can you just talk about the, the cancer clinic 
that you looked at and the attempts to try and um, reform it and also the sort of dramatic the impact on people's lives. If you've got a child that needs treated for ca cancer, you've got to start paying thousands of dollars there. And that's very, very difficult for a poor Ukrainian. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 in fact, the genesis of this book came out in Ukraine. It was work. I'm, I'm a, a Russian speaker and a former Sovietist myself. And, and I was out there um, after their revolution that they had in 2014. And, um, and I kept hearing about corruption. And I suppose I, I felt I knew corruption. I'd lived in Russia for many years. I would had bribes extorted from me many times. I thought I knew what corruption was. But um, it was only by looking at, you know, the crimes of the former government there and, and, the, and the ownership of the money they'd stolen and the way that it was owned offshore that I realized that corruption in Ukraine is not a, just a Ukrainian problem. It is a transnational issue. The money is only being stolen from Ukraine, essentially with the assistance of lawyers or accountants or shell companies from other places like the UK or, or Austria or wherever. Um, and it's very difficult. It's just such a huge issue. Um, and the amount of money involved is so enormous that it's actually very difficult to tell the story because you start talking about millions and billions and trillions and people just glaze over because the amount of these, these numbers are just so vast. Um, so I, it was, I was trying to find essentially a way of, of, of putting it in human terms. You know, what does corruption actually mean? And I met a, a doctor, Andrei Semivalos, who's a surgeon, a cancer surgeon in Ukraine, who was telling me about this battle that he was going through, attempt to, essentially after the revolution, attempting to wrest control of the clinic where he worked, which was a state-owned clinic from this very, very powerful um, regional boss, essentially, who had almost, you know, it, it was a state-owned clinic, but it's essentially privatized the, the, the money that went into it and, and took most of it for himself. Um, and ended up, you ended up with a with a clinic that was perfectly well funded, but but the patients were having to pay bribes to doctors to get, you know, to get their patients, patients that made often children admitted to the clinic. And to, and then every time they every step of the way, they had to pay more bribes, bribes to be examined, bribes to be treated, bribes to receive medicine bribes to be, you know, get follow up appointments and so on. And if you imagine your child has got cancer, you'll pay anything, right? I mean, you know, these, the, the, the doctors were in a very powerful position, they could essentially extort as much money as they wanted. Um, and there was a, you know, after the revolution, a group of, of idealistic doctors mm -hmm. were attempting to overthrow the administration of the clinic to try and force a, um, a new way of doing business, whereby they just accepted patients who needed their care, who needed care and, 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 and treated them for free as they should have done, because that's what Ukrainian law demands. Um, and, you know, it became, I mean, it sounds very simple when you put it like that, but the problem is that, that when power is involved, you know, and you can't be corrupt without power, um, it's very difficult to, 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 to dethrone these people because they control the committees, they control and everything. And essentially what ended up with, with this story of the cancer clinic is corruption in miniature because you're talking about you know ordinary people and some idealistic lower ranked officials who are essentially the victims of a system which is structured like a pyramid um, in that every bribe that is paid at the lowest level by ordinary people the, 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 the bribe takers then have to pass some of that money onto their superiors it goes up to their superiors up to their superiors till eventually you have a very small number of people at the top of this pyramid the, the, the presidents the, the cancer clinic directors who become very wealthy you know, huge amounts of money that they can earn from this. And so they really, really don't want anything to be done to change it. And the problem is that all the doctors lower down who have had to take bribes in order to live because their salaries are so small, they're all guilty of corruption too. Everyone is guilty. Um, you know, a system, a pyramidical system is created so everyone is complicit in this terrible system. And it's very, very hard to do anything about it because, yeah. you know, there are no clean state bodies that you can use to reform the system. There are no clean police officers. There are no clean courts. There's no clean anything. There is no fixed point you can use to change this system. And that's the tremendous difficulty that Ukrainians had. Um, you know, and they are, you know, they are still battling. It's been, what, seven years since their revolution, more than seven years. And they have managed to affect change in Ukraine. And there has been change in the cancer clinic, not much, but some. Um, but, you know, it's been incredibly difficult just because you have a very small number of very powerful, very wealthy men, and they are almost invariably men, um, who managed to leverage their power to gain wealth and their wealth to gain power. And all their wealth is held offshore anonymously. It's very difficult to track it down, to find it, to confiscate it. And, and you know, how can ordinary people assert, you know, what should be their democratic control over this, over the, over the processes in the country when faced with that degree of wealth and power? It's very hard. Yeah, um, we, we, we've, you've got people watching this program and um, we've, we've been, we were in Ukraine at the same time, going to see Yanukovych's um, enormous log cabin 
and the, the various things taken around by a guy, a guy with a flag draped, draped around him um, to go and see his um, gold-plated loose, and um, it was marvellous. Well, um, I mean, it's, it's a pretty striking point just to talk about how difficult it is to do something about that. That palace, Mejihiria, was owned by a shell company registered in London, in the UK, which was in turn owned by a foundation in Liechtenstein. Even though the president fled more than seven years ago, the court case to confiscate that palace has still not been able to achieve a result because they found it so hard to cut through the shell companies involved to get to the, the end of the chain of ownership, even with the president's property, leaving aside the oligarch's property and all the other various regional corrupt bosses. Yeah. The Ukrainian courts find it so difficult to get results and get any kind of traction on, on these corrupt officials just because you know, you, you end up lost in this offshore labyrinth of who owns what and where is it owned and how is it owned and, and so on. It becomes very hard for police officers or prosecutors to do anything. You know, they're paid almost nothing and they're up against lawyers who are paid a fortune. Now, you've made that link very clearly now between the, the victims and this system that essentially launders the money. I'm sure that I know and I'm sure there are probably, probably people here watching who know there are, there are law firms out there, there are, are private banks in London who are going to sort, you know, who, who are providing these services. But yet we don't have the same sense of um, wrath or anger. Um, there, there isn't the same sense of responsibility attached to them. Can you just talk a bit about your tour that you've done in London and highlighting some of the, the, um, the houses, the oligarchs, the kind of people who are living in London. And essentially these are the benefactors of this system that washes the money. Yeah, I mean, it's, so the kleptocracy tours were not my idea. Um, I wish they had been. My, I'm not, sadly not quite that imaginative, but they were created by a friend of mine, Roman Borisovich, who is a, a Russian-born um, uh, banker and insurance executive who's, who's worked all over the world. And he now um, works very closely um, with Alexei Navalny, the Russian anti-corruption activist who's, who's in prison for having survived a poisoning attempt. I think his, his latest crime was not being killed when the Kremlin wanted him to be killed. Um, so he had to go to jail, obviously. Um, so Roman works closely with Navalny and many other anti-corruption activists. And he, he, you know, like me, is very concerned by the problem of how do you make people in the West aware that corruption is as much a problem in the West as it is in the East. Um, you know, we, we think of corruption, you know, as in the Transparency International Corruption Perceptions Index. You know, you, you don't rank countries by where the stolen money ends up. You rank it by where the money comes from. You know, South Sudan is very, very corrupt, but the United States is not, or Ukraine is corrupt, but Britain is not. And it's how do you change that calculation to make people here as aware as people in Ukraine are of the damage corruption does and of our complicity in it. So Roman created the idea of the, of the kleptocracy tour, which I joined in very enthusiastically. And it's basically modeled on a Hollywood tour. You know, you, you put people on a bus, you have tour guides, and you drive these people around and you point out properties that belong to oligarchs. Uh, kleptocrats um and and you tell the story of the money that bought that where did the money come from that bought that palace um you know and the great thing about london is that it's such a target rich environment that i mean essentially you could just keep going for weeks um mm. you know there are forty thousand properties owned offshore in london i'm not sure obviously the majority of them are not criminally acquired but sufficient number of them are to mean that it's going to keep us busy so we'd normally um, focus on say westminster knightsbridge um you know, we'd often start at the um, uh, of an apartment which belonged to a guy who at the time was the Russian deputy prime minister. He now has another high ranking job in Russia, but he, he was then the Russian deputy prime minister. He owned a huge, gorgeous luxury duplex apartment just just down just down river from the House of Parliament, about five minutes walk from Portcullis House. So we'd start there and then we'd often go by a house belonging to one of Putin's oldest friends. And then there was his tame oligarch in Ukraine, Dmitry Firtash, who, who actually bought a tube station from the government in 2014, improbably. Um, I mean, but the how idea of what- How much that cost? How much the tube station? Uh, well, it cost him 53 million pounds, but, but there's actually a program designed to encourage the building of social housing, which if you buy property from the government, you only have to pay a third up front, and then you pay the second two thirds after you developed it. So he had no intention, obviously, of building social housing, but he was allowed to take advantage of that just to make sure that, that it all went smoothly. Um, tragically, he's never um, been able to develop it because um, just a couple of weeks after he bought it, he was arrested on an FBI warrant in Austria, and he's been battling extradition ever since. Um, but, you know, say we would often go and, and take people to his house, which we enjoyed. Up in North London, if we had, if the traffic wasn't too bad, 
there's a the the second largest property in in in, in London after Buckingham Palace called Wittenhurst, which belongs to a guy called Andrei Guriev, who's a member of the Russian Upper House of Parliament and a and a, and a fertilizer magnate. You know, I mean, the, the these aren't just Russians or Ukrainians or Kazakhs. Um, you know, they're obviously Nigerians, um, people Egyptians, people from the Gulf. Um, you know, we, we're Angolans. You know, it's just a question of who who was available to be a guide that day. I mean, we could we could have done it every day of the week. Um, okay. I mean, you know, but they were quite successful in terms of raising awareness. You know, we I think we really managed to make a lot of people aware of London's role, central role, as both a, a laundering center and a wealth haven for for dirty money. But um, you know, I, I sadly we haven't managed to change the situation enough for the government actually to do anything about it. But but yeah, I think there is now much greater awareness than there was. Yeah, well, that, that's what we're going to come on to now in terms of, you know, what's happening in terms of um, what can be done about things. Let, let's start getting people's questions. If people could start putting their questions in the, the Q&A box. Um, there, there are lots of questions to be asked here. I mean, post-Brexit, there are thoughts about the UK trying to become more liberal and uh, deregulate. Um, so what implication does that have? That That's in the, certainly in the back of one's mind. And there's, I think there is now an increased debate about um, what should be done to ensure that um, companies, um, company directors, company owners are listed properly and, and so that funds can be tracked more clearly. And there's certainly a, a, a greater debate about it. But Oliver, just to start with, can you just talk about the, the services? Who are the, the firm? What are the firms that actually deal with, um, in, in, in the UK at least, and possibly in the States, um, the, the term would help you register a company, help you set up a trust. You know, who is doing this? Um, I mean, there, there are too many of them to mention, really. I mean, I got very interested in one called Formations House, um, which is based at uh, 29 Harley Street in, in West London, um, the famous Harley Street, at the, the sort of centre of private health care. I mean, the reason I was interested in it was just because that's where Yanukovych owned his palace. Um, had a company registered there and it struck me as funny that it should be Harley Street and then I realized that it wasn't just him but there were thousands of other companies many of which had been involved in some really appalling frauds all over the world for years actually um you know colossal frauds frauds of you know tens of millions of euros or, or dollars um but there are many other places just like Formations House that's just a one-off with a particularly snazzy address I mean there's one uh, there's one in, in North London where Paul Manafort owned, uh, owned a company, others in West London. Weirdly, they've, they've, they've been sort of moving out of London recently. I live in, in on the border between Wales and Herefordshire, and there's actually a small town near here called Kington that's become quite a centre for, for shell companies recently. Um, and, you know, British shell companies are the vehicle of choice for financial criminals because they're very cheap to create. And when you create them, you don't have to provide any verification information at all of the information you provide. Um, it, it, you can you can create a company in any name at all, and people do. Um, but why is it why is it so attractive? Why has um, London and I think the New York and one can think of Delaware as, as as one example. Why why are we so attractive um, to people who want to um, wash their money? Um, you know, we look legitimate. People don't really think of London as being dodgy in the same way they think of say the British Virgin Islands as being dodgy. Partly that, and partly it's just very easy to create a company here. Go online and can do it. Takes about fifteen minutes, if if not quicker. Um, and it's very cheap, just, you know, 14, 15 quid to create a company. And if you're clever about it, um, you don't even have to lie on the information you provide. If you own your company in the UK via a company offshore, um, you know, in this in the Seychelles, say, or the Marshall Islands, then then essentially it's everything that, ever, that an offshore company is with a bit of prestige added to it. It's very cheap. It's very easy. Um, and, you know, in, in terms of you know, the world's biggest ever money laundering scandals, um, particularly Danske Bank and Swedbank, which I think between them moved about 350 billion euros um, in the years up to the mid 20 teens. Um, you know, that's a volume of money, which is multiples, hundreds of times more than was moved via HSBC in Mexico City, incredible amounts of money. Um, you know, that was uh, the, 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 the main way those bank accounts were owned was via UK shell companies. And, you know, essentially, if you just type UK shell company into a search bar in Google, you'll find dozens of places that will sell you these companies or you can create one for yourself if you want to um it's very cheap and very easy um so they the, you know they're a, a real problem in the uk another real problem are um law firms which will essentially prevent people like me writing about this stuff um if you're trying to write about an oligarch who with a questionable fortune um then you will be targeted um by that oligarch's lawyers 
and, and threatened with defamation proceedings um, if, you, if you make them look bad. Um, I have two American friends, Tom and Bradley, who wrote a book about the 1MDB scandal, which was the probably the single biggest act, single act of financial crime of all time, the embezzling of an entire sovereign wealth fund from Malaysia. Um, the, the main suspect in that guy called Joe Lowe, who's been indicted um, in, he says he's not guilty, but he's been indicted by the State Department in the US and by prosecutors in Malaysia and Singapore. Um, he's being investigated all over the world. He's, he's sort of on the run. Um, uh, he, he managed to retain British lawyers to prevent them publishing a book in the UK. The book had already been published in the United States to very good reviews. It was very well respected and you know, sold thousands and thousands of copies there, but it couldn't come out in the UK for another year because it took them so long to find a publisher willing to take the risk of being sued by these people. Um, you know, it's kind of extraordinary that a man um, who is, you know, so credibly accused of committing crime, um, you know, by not just by a random person on the street, but by the US Department of Justice, was able to retain British lawyers to prevent British people reading about this crime that was committed. How, you know, how have you been, how have you fared? Have you been um, subject to lawsuits? Yeah, for, for, you know, bits and bobs. I mean, I've, I've, you know, so far, touch wood, um, mainly just threatening letters rather than actual lawsuits. Um, you know, I, it, but a threatening letter is a pretty disturbing prospect. I mean, you know, these are billionaires and, um, and they, they're able to keep fighting a lawsuit long after I've run out of money. So um, yeah, that's a threatening prospect. I have a, I have a good friend, Catherine Belton, who wrote a good book about Vladimir Putin and his various um, friends and relations. Um, right. Yeah, it's an incredibly well-reviewed book. She's a very respected journalist, used to work for the FT, now she works for Reuters. Um, and she's currently being sued by four different Russian billionaires and the Russian state oil company, Ross. All at the same time. All, all, all at the same time. You know, I mean, that's a terrifying prospect. And, you know, and, and that's enough to, to put off most journalists, that prospect. You have to be very brave or, or possibly very foolhardy to be able to take that kind of risk. And you have to be very brave as a publisher to take that kind of risk. You know, we saw um, a previous um, book uh, by an academic called Karen Dewisha, which she had a contract with Cambridge University Press. But when, she, when they saw the book, even though they said there was nothing wrong with it as a book, they pulled out of publishing it just because they said it was too legally risky. You know, that's, you know, it's, it's, it's a real issue. Um, and that's just one thing that lawyers will do here. You know, lawyers will structure businesses, you know, they, you know, it's, um, we've seen what's happening in Belarus at the moment with the, with the, um, you know, hijacking of the airplane, the um, arrest of activists, the oppression, of, um, suppression of protests and so on. You know, where did the Belarusian government raise capital last summer by issuing bonds? <coughs> well, of course, they did it right here in the UK. You know, this is the capital market for everyone. Um, mm. And you can't do that without lawyers, without bankers, without accountants, without this whole enabling industry um, that essentially um, acts to, to allow, you know, the, the rich and powerful to remain rich and powerful. I've, I've got some, some standing back a bit. I mean, there's several questions in my mind. One is that... Um, you you've done an incredible job to piece all these things together, but working out who owns what is extremely difficult for many investigators, and they they need specialist skills to do it. So, you know, it, it, it's already clear that um, uh, you know, because there are so many um jurisdictions involved, that the the web of the crime is so complex, cracking down on the criminals is very difficult. So it has to be an incentive to do so. So what do you see as the main tools to, to pre prevent this kind of crime from taking place? Um, well, I mean, the main issue is that it's very difficult to know who owns what, as you said. It's essentially very easy to steal if you have power. And, and if you have access to the international financial system, it's very easy to hide your wealth. And having hidden it, it's very easy to spend it. So the difficulty is trying to break that chain. Um, if you can make it difficult to steal, then this won't happen. If you make it difficult to hide, this won't happen. If you make it difficult to spend, this won't happen. Well, I mean, there, there, it is no reason, no, there is absolutely no um, grounds at all to expect that countries like, for example, Ecuador or Guinea, which has been you know, very badly afflicted by its ruling family, is going to do anything about this because the same ruling family that would need to do something and the same people doing the stealing. The same goes for someone like Russia. You know, the small, small clan of people around Putin are the same clan who are benefiting from the system as it currently is. It's pointless to expect them to do something to improve the system. So I think we can ignore, so essentially we can strike out the possibility of doing something about the theft end of, the, of this. 
And then trying to do something about the spending end is equally difficult because you don't really know who owns the money. Um, so it's very difficult to see um, you know, who's spending it and therefore very difficult to stop them. So the real weak link in the chain, in, the, if, in as far as there is one, the weakest or the least strong link in the chain is the middle one, the one about hiding the ownership of the money, hiding the theft of the money, doing something about that. Um, so the real policy proposal that's most important is for companies, Western companies, where this money ends up, where the money moves through, need to publish publicly who owns their companies, their trusts, their foundations, who, who the people are, rather than who the companies are. Because once you have that, it becomes very easy to see who owns what, and to see whether they should have the kind of wealth which they've managed to accrue, whether they should have access to it. Um, you know, there, there are movements towards this um, in many places. Um, the, the United States has recently passed a Corporate Transparency Act. It, it, it only gives access to ownership to, to law enforcement, but it's still better than nothing. There's previously not been any registry of ownership of companies in the US before. And, um, you know, the, the, the UK has corporate trans ownership of companies. It's very transparent, but the information is not verified, so it doesn't really mean anything. Um, many European countries are also inching towards opening up their registries, and this is all for the good. Um, but it doesn't really mean anything unless there's someone to check the information and to uh, prosecute any crimes committed by the people who, who, whose, whose, ownership, whose ownership is revealed. So the second thing we really need to do is to have some form of, of um, um, prosecution. If you commit a financial crime, you need to be prosecuted. Um, you know, as we saw, there was this big leak of, of um, emails from Mossack Fonseca, the Panamanian law firm, which was called the Panama Papers. Um, and one uh, lawyer who was revealed in that to be involved in, in helping, you know, the, um, a kleptocratic elite launder money was, was a, a British lawyer who helped the ruling family of Azerbaijan to, to move money into buying property in London. Um, you know, he really shouldn't have done this. He didn't do the checks that were required of him. It was an absolutely open and shut case, but there was no criminal prosecution at all. He was just, it was a disciplinary hearing from the Solicitor's Regulatory Authority, and, and he was fined as a result. That was it. There was no, no other action. Um, we see the same thing uh, with banks, you know, banks that move really very large amounts of money uh, in the UK or in European countries have traditionally been been fined very small amounts. You um, like to see people to go, go to jail and what, and, and what would be a jailable offence in, in, to your mind? Well, I mean, you know, it's, I would say, you know, very large amounts of theft is a jailable offence. And in the same way... Levitator, if you know you're taking funds from... Uh, it, no, in the, in, or whoever. Yeah, I mean, being a being a mafia boss is a, a jailable offence. Being a mob banker is a jailable offence. That's essentially what we're dealing with. We're dealing yeah. with an entire industry of mob bankers, and they should be going to jail, just like you know someone would be who was handling stolen cars or was or, or was, was moving you know the cash which derived from drug drugs offences. You know, we 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 need to recognise that kleptocracy, grand corruption, is is as much of a harmful crime as you know, moving huge quantities of crack cocaine. Um, so that's the, um, that's the issue that, that, that we, that's the seriousness of which we need to be approaching this issue. And we're really not at the moment. I mean, there's one, one good thing about the United States is they do impose colossal fines on financial institutions that, that move you know, this kind of money on where it was HSBC or BNP Paribas and various others, but they're still, even there, they're not very good at putting individuals in jail. And that's what makes the difference. You know, if you if it doesn't matter whether, you, you know, if, if, if the shareholders end up paying a big fine because the institution has done something wrong, but the people who actually did the, did the wrongdoing don't get any punishment themselves. That's no reason not to commit, not to continue to commit crimes. So, you know, I think that it's a, it's very disappointing. that. The, yeah, and there's certainly, as your book shows, there's certainly documentary evidence showing that these people are aware where the money comes from. And um, they, they say uh, this person's the head of a um, oil rich state. Um, and he has generated this money himself. <laughs> so I mean, that was a particularly extraordinary example of, you know, because, you know, there are, if you go through the compliance procedures, there are boxes you need to tick, you know, hoops you need to jump through. And yeah, in that particular one, it was a, the president of, of, a, East, of a West African state um, in which they, you know, they had to say where the money came from because that's the compliance procedure. And, um, and it just said self-made, brackets, is president of an oil-rich country. Um, yeah, that's not self-made, that's self-stolen. Um, but, you know, that's, that was the, the culture of, of, of finance. I think things have improved in that they would not be these days as blatant mm. as that. But that's not to say it's not happening. Um, this kind of thing is, is, 
is a real problem and it, and it continues all over the world. Okay, let's start taking some questions now. These are, these are well overdue. Diane Cook, you go ahead with your question. Hello, Diane. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm just wondering, as you're talking particularly about Ukraine, um, Oliver, do you see um, any leakage, as it were, from the people enabling in, say, London, what you've been describing? And, and it's a huge number of people. It's, and, and they go right to the top. It's not just people at the bottom. Um, I'm thinking about, you know, you recruit a member of the House of Lords to your board and that sort of thing. So we're talking uh, not just the, the company setups in small country towns, we're talking about quite serious people. Do you see that leaking into corruption, maybe in inverted commas, maybe not, in the UK itself, into the whole um, approach? Because it's very difficult to keep a Chinese wall in your own mind. Diane, I think it's a really good question. And I think it's not just the UK, it's also the, the States. I mean, I'm thinking of um, uh, this is the backing of um, academic institutions um, by people who are now um, under uh, investigation. There, there are donations to, to PACs in the States. There's a whole gamut, a huge amount of money going to influence our, and both academics and political, political system. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's a really important question. Um, you know, I, I've got a, um, a Russian friend who, who talks very, very um, incisively about this and how there was this naive idea in the nine, early 1990s about how if we opened up, you know, connections between the former Soviet Union and the West, you know, we would create this sort of pipe, almost a uh, you know, a water pipe, and we would send all of our beautiful, clean, wonderful business practices um, eastwards into the former Soviet Union and transform the place in our image in, in the most wonderful way. You know, uh, this is possibly always a bit on the naive stroke self-serving, but I, it was certainly the story that was told at the time, the idea that, that free business and free enterprise in the former Soviet Union would transform Russia and Ukraine and so on in, in you know, in, in, in this sort of capitalist democratic way. But actually, to a large extent, the process has worked as much in the opposite way as it has in that direction. The pipe which we created allowed water to flow backwards just as it did allowing it to go there. Um, in fact, my, yes, my friend Piotr refers to it as a, as, a, as, a, as a waste pipe, as a sewer, um, connecting the two together. Um, you know, so yes, I don't think there's any doubt that the business practices that particularly members of the House of Lords and indeed the House of Commons have engaged in um, have twisted their opinions. I think it would be it would be crazy to imagine that they didn't. Um, you know, you, you, I, I became very interested for a while in the extent to which people who had received hospitality from Az Azerbaijan's um, lobbyists who were working for government ministers there would come back and then speak very highly of Azerbaijan in the House of Commons. Um, you know, having gone on these very choreographed trips to Baku and Baku is, I'm sure you do trips out there, I'm sure it's a, it's a gorgeous place with some really very top end hotels and some lovely restaurant. Um, you know, they would come back full of enthusiasm for democratic transformation in Baku. You know, as someone who I've, I've had several friends in, in, in jail in Baku for being journalists, and I've been myself hacked by Azeri secret services for having, you know, dared to expose this. Um, you know, I always found this very irritating. The idea that Baku was anything other than a really grotesque kleptocracy is, was, is, is absurd, but you know, having gone out there and accepted their hospitality, this is a story that appeared to, to make a lot of sense to certain MPs. Um, we see the same um, with, you know, Ukrainians, uh, various MPs and members of the House of Lords have done very well out of Ukrainian oligarchs. And, and, and more broadly, if we look more broadly across Europe, we see strong connections between the German business elite and political elite and, and Russia and, 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 and the French as well. So it's clearly been a very successful technique by many states to, as it were, by um, the loyalty or the interest of, of, of Western elites. And it, it is very alarming, um, you know, and, and the amount of money we're talking about is, is huge. You know, mm. It doesn't, one of, the, one of the amazing things about Britain is how astonishingly little it takes to buy one of our politicians. You know? Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, you've got to give the Americans credit to buy an American politician. Um, cost, it will cost you hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. 
Um, the British politician but tends to... It's legal to do it then, in a way, though, isn't it? I mean, with Citizens United, you can give money to a super PAC or a PAC, and um, that's fine. Well, you know, if you look at the activities of the European Azerbaijan Society here, it appears to be legal here as well. I certainly don't know of any investigation into that or, or into um, the British Ukrainian Society or British Syrian Society or, or various others equivalent. I mean, you know, these are you know, lobbying organizations with all of the, all of the you know, heft of the American ones, they just were able to essentially purchase um, the friendliness of MPs for you know four-figure sums rather than six-figure sums. Right, right. It okay. doesn't take much to to persuade a uh, you know a British politician of the of the merits of your cause. And yeah, you know, of course, it, it's really worth bearing in mind that we do actually have a legitimate uh, Russian oligarch, or only means a minigarch, in the House of House of Lords these days. Yevgeny Lebedev, the Baron of Siberia, um, has taken the ermine. Um, and one of the things that I find particularly depressing about that is, you know, Russian oligarchs can't even get into the House of Lords or the upper house in Russia these days. You know, Putin's got that pretty much locked down. It used to be all Russian oligarchs would have a, a position in the upper house in Russia just to make, give them, you know, a say and give them um, immunity from prosecution. Now, that is no longer the case in Russia, but now we have one in, in London. Um, you know, if anything was an argument for reforming the House of Lords, it's the elevation of Yegeny Lebedev as Baron of Siberia. It's like some kind of terrible bad joke, really. Barbara Clark. Hello, Barbara. Go Hello. On. Hello. Um, my question is just, is all of this really um, behind the Brexit project, as some that of us... That sounds like a conspiracy theory, Barbara. I mean, are you saying there's part of some big plan? I don't, what's your question? I don't get it. Um, those who... Certain of those who have pushed for a long time to distance themselves from the EU and the EU regulation and things like that. Is there an yeah. element in the Brexit pack that is doing it for this sort of reason? I gotta say, I'm not really persuaded of that argument for, for, for a number of reasons. Um, partly, you know, the, the City of London did not speak with one voice on this issue. Um, there was a large amount of opinion in the city that wanted to remain part of the EU. And the other one, I think we have this entirely erroneous impression in the UK that, that European institutions and countries are much better when it comes to fighting financial crime than we are. Um, now, in Britain, we're much better at financial crime and enabling it than they are in that we do much more of it. But that doesn't mean that we're the only place that does it. I mean, if you look at, you know, the truly gargantuan money laundering scandals of recent years and the countries where they've taken place, um, you know, there's, there's been banks from Sweden, Denmark, France, the Netherlands, Germany, Cyprus, Malta, um, Austria, uh, Finland, you know, and that's just the ones that occur to me off the top of my head. Um, you know, the, the European regulations have been just as bad at stopping countries that are still in the EU from moving money as, as um, European regulations were at stopping British institutions at, at moving money. Um, we just, you know, we do it to a much larger extent. You know, so I do think that, you know, there is an aspect of some, certainly some many of the more vocal Brexit supporters, um, you know, would sort of speak about this, this sort of buccaneering Britain trying to re return to a kind of regulation light, regulation free financial mm -hmm. system. But I don't think, I certainly don't think that that explains the entirety of the appeal for Brexit. I don't think that, you know, people around where I live, many of them who, who voted Brexit, certainly the older people around here, many of them voted for Brexit. I don't think that motivated why they were doing it. I think they had far more, you know, simple reasons for, for supporting well, Brexit. Well, there is a, there's a temptation. Some people talk about um, Singapore on, on Thames. Um, yeah. Yeah. The actual, if you can, um, you know, if, if, if there's tighter regulation in Europe and maybe also in the States, maybe there's an opportunity for the city. Uh, yeah, I mean, I suppose my 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 response to that is I don't really see how regulation could be any looser. So, um, you know, I mean, Singapore, Singapore seems to be held up as if it's worse than we are. Um, it, it really isn't. Um, not only that, but it's got really fantastic social housing. Um, so I'm not, I, I can't see, I just can't see the argument that Britain, I mean, you know, Britain moves, I mean, we don't really know how much dirty money Britain moves because no one really checks it. But, you know, according to the government's own estimates, we're talking about hundreds of billions of pounds a year, dirty money moving by the city of London. Um, I don't really see how that could be worse, uh, to be honest. Um, you know, there is currently, you know, it, you know, our, the International Corruption Unit at the National Crime Agency has an annual budget of just over four million pounds. You know, that, that an oligarch would easily spend that at Harrods in a year. 
um, yeah, that's not a sum of money put forward by a serious country wanting to fight international corruption. That's that's absurd. Um, you know, it's a rounding error. And the same is true of, of you know, the, the, the serious fraud office. You know, I have com contacts in America who say, well, the serious fraud office tries very hard, but there's really not very much you can do with 30 people, not when you're up against, you know, serious fraud. Um, mm. it, you know, these are ludicrously underfunded organizations. Um, we, you know, we're up against some incredibly well-resourced oligarchs. And if we were serious about tackling financial crime, then, you know, we would have hundreds of people at the serious fraud office, if not thousands. Um, you know, we would have a, a dedicated police force dedicated to fi fighting financial crime, which we don't have. Um, so I don't see how the Brexit project, um, you know, and I appreciate there are probably good reasons to support it as well as, you know, reasons to oppose it. You know, it's just one of those things, isn't it? like the weather, I think we just have to put up with it. Um, but I, I don't think it's likely to make us any e make it any easier for Britain to enable financial crime because you know Britain is already top of the tree on that game. I don't think we're likely to it's likely ever to be any easier than it is. Mm. But Oliver, do you think there's a, a sort of pendulum in terms of you know sort of political and economic trends? If you think about the sort of post-war era, you had sort of great state inter intervention, and then you get Thatcherism reacting to it. Um, is the pendulum swinging back again when we we feel as though there has to be greater government role in society. There's certainly going to be more taxation after the huge uh, debt debts we've built up. Um, you know, so that perhaps there'll be more appetite. I mean, I'm just wondering whether you're feeling more optimistic about that. I've got to say, you know, there was a period, sounds slightly ironic in the circumstances considering how awful he was, but there was a period in the David Cameron years when, when Britain kind of made a lot of the running when it came to financial crime issues and kleptocracy issues. Um, you know, we had this very generous foreign aid budget. Um, you know, we convened a big anti-corruption conference in 2016, just before the Brexit vote. Um, you know, there was a lot, a lot of those, um, you know, help for countries after the Arab Spring and stuff was coming from the UK. Uh, that's all gone. Um, as far as I can tell, Boris Johnson doesn't care about this. Um, and no one anywhere near him cares about this. Um, so I don't know. I'm not optimistic, to be honest, not about the UK at all. Um, However, where there is a ground for optimism, and it's not a small thing, is, is in the United States, where the White House, the administration now, um, seems to have a very deep understanding of both the causes of kleptocracy and the harm that it does, not just as a financial crime issue, but as a national security issue. So, you yeah, know, that is hopeful. The weather is currently being made in Washington. And, you know, um, normally when America wants something, America gets it. So, you know, when they, um, when Barack Obama was in the White House, they pushed very hard and managed to forced Switzerland to abandon banking secrecy, which was a, you know, a massive change. Um, and, and it would be great if they would do the same with, you know, forcing tax havens to be take, you know, corporate transparency seriously. Um, you know, if they were to do that, I'm sure it would come about. So where there is grounds for optimism, it comes from Joe Biden's White House. It sadly doesn't come from D Downing Street here, who, 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 you know, I mean, I don't, I don't see any reason to think that, to expect anything of any kind good from them. I mean, where they talk about fraud, they talk about voter fraud, even though that's a completely confected non-issue. Mm. Um, you know, when they talk about freedom of, freedom of speech, they're talking about right-wing academics. They're not talking about journalists trying to write about oligarchs. So it's- uh, Transparency um, is, the, is, is the key issue, isn't it? So ownership of assets, ownership of, com of companies is the key thing. Yeah, um, properly, ver properly verified transparency, yeah. Yeah. Um, Sheila de Blake, last question, and, and then we've got to wrap up. Sheila. Oh, hello. I'm afraid this is probably a very flippant question, but can we be sure that Rishi Sunak hasn't borrowed dirty money to pay for all the expenses caused by the pandemic? No, no, we can't. Um, it would be very weird indeed, considering how much money that we have borrowed as a nation, that some of it hadn't ended up from rather unfortunate sources. Um, you know, the, the British government bond market is very deep and very liquid and everyone likes to buy gilts. Um, you know, um, you Rishi don't Sunak can buy the gilts, do you? I mean, the gilts can be bought by anybody. Exactly. Mm. You know, and and and. But then, I mean, it it does. You know, it you know it does. I don't think that's a new thing. Um, you know, if you look at, say, Britain's golden visa program, the, the tier one investor visas, which we've been selling since the eighties, not always under that name, but but or since the nineties rather, not always under that name, but we've been selling visas to high net worth foreigners. Um, you know, we, we never, until very relatively recently, we didn't check where the money came from. Um, we just, if you, if you had money, you, you could buy them. That money went straight into the government's purse and was used for general government spending. 
Um, so there's been dirty money from that source going into the into the budget for a long time. Um, we look at Dimitri Firtash buying a tube station. You know, that money went into the government budget and went to general government general government spending. I mean, that was suspicious money. I mean, there are many other examples of a similar kind. Um, so, you know, and then going all the way back to the birth of offshore in the 1950s and 60s, you know, the, the, the rebirth of the City of London grew out of offshore finance, this tax evading or kleptocratic cash. So this money has been um, pumping up the British economy for a very long time. Um, so if dirty money has gone into, um, you know, buying government debt to help Rishi Sunak um, do whatever it is that Rishi Sunak has been doing, um, then... Uh, yeah, that's just a continuation of a trend that's been going on for a long time, and and, and I fear it's not going to stop anytime soon unless we get much much more serious about checking the origins of people's wealth. So, uh, not not a flippant question, a good question, Sheila. Very good, very good question. Yeah. Um. Here, here's the book. Um. It really is well worth reading, and I, I really do um sort of credit to you because it's an encyclopedia. The amount of work and research you've done um, in it, and it's it reads well, but you've also you've got the mind of a barrister, and you can sort of pin things down as well. What are you working on at the moment? I've been writing another book, um, which is almost done and coming out in the spring. That's specifically about Britain's role um, uh, in, in enabling um, bad behaviour. It's called Butler to the World, um, and that's coming out in the spring. Um, I'm also writing some articles, um, which is what I do the rest of my time. Um, uh, which are fun, and I'm actually quite keen to do a podcast series or possibly a TV show about Billy Herbert, the um, St Kitts and Nevis uh, diplomat and offshore lawyer um, who had such a colourful life. But um, you know that's that's in discussion at the moment. So there's always there's always something going on. There's definitely a Netflix series in that one there. And that's very good. That's very good. Thank you very much indeed, Oliver. It's been a really really good discussion. Very informative. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Oliver Below. My pleasure. Thanks for listening.